that I enjoy attending book clubs by, you know, on Zoom. Right. And that it's so fun to hear what other people see in your world that you created. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, it was so funny. I'm sure you experienced this as well. You go through so many versions of your book that in the end, by the time, you know, it was seven years before it was published in the end, you go, wait, did that happen or didn't it happen? (laughs) Welcome to Story Power, a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I geek out about the stories we are passionate about in all different genres, styles, and formats. My name is Lucinda Sage Midgordon, and I started this podcast in the summer of 2020 at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. As I watched the reaction of my friends, family, and social media circle, I noticed that many people turn to stories for comfort and help in making sense of the craziness going on around them. My goal was to do the same for my listeners, but as I chatted with my guests throughout the first year, I discovered that their personal stories were the most fascinating thing about each episode. Neil Gaiman says, fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. I now know that sharing our experiences with others helps us defeat our own dragons. It is our stories that connect us to one another. Let's see what wisdom today's guest has to share with us. Today my guest is Tammy Uliano, and this is episode 53. Tammy, welcome to the show. I was looking at your Podmatch profile and oh my goodness, you do all kinds of things. You write novels, you are a physician, and you're a professor at the University of Florida. How do you juggle all of those balls? <laughs> it's a full life. It's uh, I'm very fortunate to have so many great opportunities and, and varied interests. When I had kids still at home, it was a way more challenging, definitely. Oh. Um, now that they're all off in graduate school in various places, I'm I have a lot more time that I can direct in the in the areas that I want to. So I've gone to sixty percent at the hospital. So I'm not doing quite as much time oh. there. Uh-huh. And I stopped my research protocols and resigned my major administrative positions. So so now I'm mostly just a doctor and a teacher and a writer, a, a wife and a yeah, a mother and a. And a dog lover. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. So yeah, you have to walk the dog every day. Uh, yes. Twice a day, maybe. <laughs> At least. <laughs> um, so do you live near the beach and can you walk your dog on the beach? Not the beach. We have a house on a lake, though. That's where I am right now. Oh, and cool. um, and so this morning I stood outside with my, I put my laptop on a on a stand and I can stand outside and throw the ball for the dogs and right in between uh, chuck it throws. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. So um, I was looking at, again, I was looking at your profile and you have a novel named Fatal Intent. It's a medical thriller. And I was so impressed that Kathy Reichs endorsed your book. How did you get that endorsement? She's she's amazing. I've met her. So there's a meeting every summer in New York City called Thriller Fest, where oh. thriller writers go and they're, they are just the most giving, generous, wonderful people. So the first couple of days is mostly for writers and they do panels and craft things and all these really famous authors just volunteer their information to to help new writers. And then the the second two days are mostly, a lot of it is just readers coming because they want to see them and meet them in the hallway. And they have cocktail hour every night where you can just walk up to Lee Child and Kathy Reichs and all these other people and just say hi. So I met her there. And then when I was told to start finding blurbs for my book. I found her email and told her that I'd met her, although I'm sure she didn't remember me, but by saying I was a physician and it was during COVID, I think, I think a lot of my blurbs came from very busy authors who were less busy because they couldn't travel during COVID. And so they had a little bit more time to, to be willing to read the book and, and write little statements, which is wonderful. I'm sure it's made a huge difference in in the credibility of a brand new author. 
Oh yes, because I don't have anything like that on my on my <laughs> book. So yeah, that's fantastic. I love it. So the, what time of year is the Thriller Fest? It's uh, this year. It's actually uh, May. 31st, I guess, to June 4th. It used oh. to be always right around July 4th, but they moved it up this year. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so you'll be going again, I imagine. Oh, yes. Yes. We've had two years without, so I'm excited to go again. You yeah. make so many great friends. Writers are just such friendly, giving people, and uh, it's really fun to to meet people, and then you meet new people each time, and it's yeah. uh, it's a really great way to get other people who are at your level and supportive, but also mm -hmm. um, mentor type people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So do you read other people's books and, and endorse them now that you're uh, <laughs> a famous author? <laughs> I've done my uh, famous, not really. I've done one so far from uh -huh. for a friend who uh, I had read it earlier and been sort of a critiquer. And then I, I read the final version and, and wrote a blurb for her. Hers comes out in March. Yeah. I mean, Obviously, you you pay it forward and you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you bring everybody yeah. up. It's it's uh it's cool. I'm I've got to learn how to do it. I've done a lot of medical reviewing of articles and and right. critiquing that way, but learning how to write there's a, a definite flair to to blurbs that you have to learn. Yeah, well, just writing the blurb for my book, it was it was that was difficult, and I have a better blurb now that I include on my blog, but I haven't gone to Amazon or any of the other places to switch it out, you know, to switch yeah. out the blurb. But yeah, so tell about your book. I'm, I had, I just found out about it since you and I only connected, what, about a week ago. I haven't yeah. read it yet. So tell about your book. So it's, um, as most people, I guess, who write first novels, it's, it's a little bit about, it's a little autobiographical, although not really, mm -hmm. but my character is a anesthesiologist at a Florida hospital that is definitely not the hospital I work at. Um, <laughs> and, um, and she stumbles upon a, a series of unexpected deaths of some elderly and, and disabled patients uh -huh. and um, ends up uncovering a mercy killer for hire scheme. And her very eccentric and hilarious great aunt, or I think she's hilarious, and, uh, and another character try to figure out what's going on. And, and when they find out that her husband, who's in a coma, is uh, they have to rush to the end, and stop the crime, the criminal. Oh, yes. So really? it brings up issues of the end of life and how should people die. And on my website, I have a resources section about getting living wills done and mm -hmm. assigning someone to be your healthcare surrogate. And, you know, Mostly it's just a thriller, but in, in part of it, I hope people are are uh, thinking about what they want and what they would do in Kate's situation and and mm -hmm. uh, and how how they would like to to have their last days managed if they are unable to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's important. That's very good. I love how you're linking your fictional story to helping people with their real lives. I like that. It's I, it's fun. What's really fun to me is taking sort of things I find morally ambiguous. Like mm -hmm. I I can come up with an argument very strongly on 180 degree different sides of the of of the end of life, and then giving characters each of those differing opinions, and then giving them cogent arguments mm -hmm. um, where nobody seems to be completely wrong. And um, mm -hmm. I think that's that's fun. If if you can't see other sides, then then you're not looking very hard. So yeah. it's I think it's fun, and I've had really good feedback from book clubs that they. Oh, get nice. into good discussions about that. I enjoy attending book clubs by, you know, on Zoom. Right. And uh, it's so fun to hear what other people see in your world that you created. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? Because sometimes you don't even know that they're going to take it that way. <laughs> right. And also, you know, it was so funny. I'm sure you experienced this as well. You go through so many versions of your book. Oh, that yeah. in the end, by the time, you know, it was seven years before it was published. In the end, you go, wait, 
did that happen or didn't it happen? <laughs> right. Oh, was that in an earlier draft or? Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yes. That's so true. That's right. I love it. So what, uh, what do you teach at the University of Florida? I teach physiology to uh, medical students mm -hmm. and uh, mostly I teach anesthesia residents. So I teach them uh -huh. how to take care of patients and I specialize in obstetric anesthesia. So I mostly teach mm -hmm. them how to take care of pregnant women and mm -hmm. do labor epidurals and C-sections, but also learn how to handle the rare major complications because we're a what's called a tertiary care center. So we get all the sickest pregnant mm -hmm. ladies from oh. South Georgia down almost to Orlando. Oh, so, wow. so we get a, a good share of very complicated cases. And it's, uh, it's my job to teach the residents how to handle it and how to recognize when things are going to be more challenging than, than the usual. Oh yeah. So is that part-time or full-time? I'm 60% now. So three oh. days a week I'm at the hospital. Okay. And oh. I don't only do OB. I also do some, um, like yesterday I was in the main OR taking care of general surgery and ear, nose and throat and gynecologic surgery. So it's, Usually two days a week, I'm on labor and delivery, and one day a week, I'm in the main OR. Oh, yeah. Okay. My mom and my sister both had toxemia. Oh. Yeah. In fact, my mom had toxemia with that sister who had toxemia. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, my, and we lived in a very small town in Washington State, Goldendale, Washington, and my mom was very fortunate to have a doctor who had had a patient with it before and uh, had died, I think. And so he recognized the signs and started talking to his colleagues in other cities. And if it hadn't been for that, my mom might have died and my sister might have died, but they didn't. They were okay. So. Yep. Yeah, it's um the incidence, it's now called preeclampsia instead of toxemia. Right. And uh, the incidence has gone up. It's now about three to five percent in the <gasps> US population, much higher in Africa. Ooh. So yeah, we're seeing quite a lot of it. And do they know why or what causes it? We don't really. We know a fair amount about what happens, but we don't really know why it happens in the first place. But we do know that if a woman gets preeclampsia with one pregnancy, if she keeps the same partner for subsequent pregnancies, that she'll probably have preeclampsia with those as well. And uh, or the, the risk is higher. And so now there's some things like if you take a baby aspirin very early in pregnancy and, and keep going, you can get less sick. Mm. Um, and there's a range. Some people are very minor symptoms, but still have the blood pressure issues and the other symptoms, but others get very, very sick. So oh, no. probably it's two different diseases that we're calling the same thing, mm. but we don't, we don't know that yet. Yeah. Still doing research on that. Yes. Yes. That was one of my areas of research when I was doing my stuff. Yeah. So are you working on another book now? Well, the second in the series um, is with the publisher. They're working on the cover right now, but it doesn't come out till January. Mm -hmm. It's done. Um, final edits were last week. And then the third in the series is what I'm working on right now. Mm -hmm. um, they want it by the summer. And then I have some standalones that I'm trying to get published. That particular publisher, Ocean View, mm -hmm. um, they're not, they're mostly mysteries and thrillers. And the other ones I have done are just a little bit out of their wheelhouse. So I'm oh. still trying to find an agent or mm -hmm. um, someone else to publish those, but I, mm -hmm. I love them and I want them to get out there in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I may end up self-publishing, but I'm reluctant. I just admire so much my friends who can self-publish, but there's so much to it that I don't uh, really want to have to deal with making covers and all that sort of yes. stuff. I, I like it that my publisher who knows very, very well how to do all that stuff handles. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. We self published or independently published uh, my book, but my husband's a graphic artist, so he could lay it out. He did the cover. He helped me with the editing. I mean, you know, so great. yeah, I, the marketing part of it is the part that I really need help with, but I've talked to a couple of other podcast guests 
that I met through Podmatch who have used hybrid publishers. So I'm look I'm thinking maybe I'm going to look into that for the sequel to my novel and maybe I'll republish the first one too. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I'm kind of busy with the podcast right now. Podmatch is just this wonderful resource. I have so That's many people. Great. You've done like, so many. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, the full, whole first year were just people I knew at the college or students or uh, fam- friends and family or college, you know, but the but uh, sometime in the middle of the second year is when I found or Podmatch found me. And uh, most of my guests are from Podmatch. And I just love the variety of the people that I have met and the conversations that I've had. It's just it's uh, every every other day or well, it's sometimes it's just once a week that I do an interview. Uh, it's just so fun to talk to people like you with varying you have some fascinating guests. So good for you. Yes. And varying backgrounds and things. It's that's just so great. So, so do you think you'll keep writing? Do you enjoy that? I love it. I would love to have more time to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it, if I only have, you know, 30 minutes at night after a, a bad day at the hospital, I, I can't really get into it. I need mm. these these days where I have all day to do it. But then there's always other things that take up your time, right? So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um so yeah, it's always sort of hanging there with me wanting to do, you know, all weekend long when I really should be spending time with my husband or <laughs> reading a book or whatever. My characters are still yammering in the back of my head, wanting me to get back to the computer and write. But, Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so far I absolutely love it. And um, I, I want to continue and hopefully the ideas will keep flowing. Oh, they probably will. I don't know about you, but I've been keeping a blog for since 2013. And, you know, I keep thinking, oh, I'm, going to run out of ideas, but then some new idea comes for the next week's blog. So it'll probably happen that way for you too, because you have a wealth of experience and knowledge that you can put into your books. It's, it's fun. It's, you know, there's a line that's difficult to navigate of how much of your experience you put in there and how Mm. much detail you put in there. Um, because you want to be true to what really happens, but you don't want to bore people or gross out people who um, who don't have any medical background. So, uh, so that's been a challenge. I, I'm getting better at it, mm-hmm. but um, my, you know, if you read the first version of, of Fatal Intent, it would be not anywhere close to where it needed to be <laughs> on that on that score. Well, I had a friend who said your first draft is going to be crap and you just have to accept that. (laughs) That's right. The Anne Lamont sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's okay. Just write it anyway, and then you can revise it. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Yeah. I love that. So do you keep in contact with your students or, or anything like that? I mean, I've been teaching for a long time, so uh, you know, still, I still keep in contact with some of my students. I was wondering if that happens for you. What What do you teach? Theater. Oh, mm-hmm. awesome. Okay. The, um, the medical students, not very much, although every once in a while, one will just cross paths and go, oh, you taught me physiology back mm-hmm. in whatever year. But the residents I do still hear from. So they've finished medical school. I spend a lot more time with them. And I was in charge of the residency program for five years. And so that was 88 residents a year times four years, although. Oh, yeah. So so they I will keep in touch with, you know, through Facebook or mm-hmm. um, if I go to national meetings, they'll uh, mm-hmm. I'll see them there. Mm-hmm. Um, or sometimes if they have a complicated case, they'll call me and ask mm-hmm. questions um, if it's an OB kind of case. Mm-hmm. So so somewhat. Um, you know, it's a very busy time of life for them when they're in residency and um, when they get out and starting in the real world. And most of them are at an age where they're starting their families. And yes. um, so it's fun to watch them grow up on Facebook. And yes, that, it, that is fun. That is fun. Yeah. 
Some of my first year high school students have children now, and it's so fun to watch them, you know, their little kids, how they're growing and stuff. Yeah, that is fun. Uh, That's when I was teaching high school. Yes, but I would think that doctors are so busy, so it might be hard to keep in contact with them. Mostly it would be a when we go to the, with our big national meeting is called the American Society of Anesthesiologists once a year. And that's a great place to, to reconnect. Um, ah. But now that I'm not doing research anymore, I don't go to that meeting as much because um, mm-hmm. somebody has to stay and run the operating rooms while the, mm. the more junior faculty go. Now that I've made full professor, I don't have to publish anymore. And, uh, mm-hmm. and so mostly my, my work is promoting my junior colleagues and helping them develop research protocols and, Oh, um, nice. helping them write stuff up. So, um, so it's less important for me to attend the meetings and, mm-hmm. uh, and I'd rather go to writer meetings at this point in my oh, career. It's sort really? of a, a career pivot for me. Yeah. You're not third, retirement, but you're shifted second years. or third, your second or third career, <laughs> right? The encore career. Um, yeah. Encore yeah. career. Yeah. Right. That's cool. Well, and so I'm assuming that the hospital is affiliated with the university. Is that right? Yes. Ours is an an academic teaching center. Yeah, we have, they allow a couple of non-academic faculty, but pretty much all of the faculty are, um, all of the doctors at our hospital are faculty of the University of Florida College of Medicine. Oh, wow. That's great. So where is that located? It's in Gainesville, Florida. So North oh. Central, it's about an hour and a half um, southwest of Jacksonville. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my, I have a sister that lives um, in the uh, Tampa area. Uh-huh. We're about a couple hours from there. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I'm a lifelong and second generation Gator. Oh, um, my wow. dad graduated from there and I went to undergrad and medical school and residency and fellowship and have oh. been on faculty since. 97. So, Mm -hmm. and my husband went there and one of our three kids went, went to UF. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. Are they spread across the country or are they close by? Can you go visit? No, nope. I've got one in Houston doing a PhD, one in St. Louis getting a master's and one in Boston getting a master's. So at least only one time zone away. That helps a lot. Yes, that does help a lot. Yeah. We live in Arizona and my husband's family, his brother and his family and father and mother live in Missouri. And then I have a sister who lives in Florida, a brother who lives in Denver and another sister and my mom and her family all live in uh, the Seattle area. So, oh my goodness, so truly kind of, all over the country. We're kind of spread apart. Yeah. And then I have an, a cousin who lives in Vermont. <laughs> so oh, we don't get you cover to see, the whole thing. We don't get to see him very often. Yeah, we do. Yeah. We cover the whole country practically. So yeah, but it, it's kind of fun. We enjoy driving. We drive, we're going to drive up to um, Washington for this is going to air after my mom's birthday. So I can say this, we're having a 90th, a surprise 90th birthday party for my mom um, on the Oregon coast. Yes. And it's going to be a big family reunion. She doesn't know everyone's coming. So that's going to be fun. That's fantastic. We went up and hiked the um, Olympic peninsula last summer. Oh, it was very beautiful. Yes, it is beautiful. So this is our third one because last July, uh, so that's in July. Last July, my husband's brother turned 60. So we surprised him. We drove up to Missouri, surprised him. And then in December, his dad turned 90. And so we drove up there again. <laughs> it's like, wow. oh, I think we'll be ready to stay home for a little while after that. That's a lot of driving. Three trips in a row, you know, in within five or six months of each other. Yeah. Yeah. But it's fun. Yeah. I love seeing the countryside and the differences and, and you meet so many really interesting people, especially right after kind of everything was starting to open up with COVID and people were so friendly. They were so happy to be, you know, I mean, they were still wearing their masks and stuff, but they were just, Oh, so happy to see you. And (laughs) it's just really great. So that was neat. Yeah. Yes. I'm ready for the masks to be done too, but yes. Me too, but we're still using them at the college. Good. So, yeah. How are you? 
Yeah, at yeah. the hospital, we have to have a N95 or a KN95 on mm-hmm. at all times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Getting well, old. Well, I only teach part-time and only the acting class is face-to-face. The other class that I teach is a virtual class. So oh, that's good. And it's only in the fall. So, yeah. But we have club things that we do. And so we wear masks for those. Yeah. Good. But yeah, hopefully maybe in a next by next year, we won't have to wear our masks anymore. <laughs> yeah. God willing. Yeah. Do you include anything, anything like that in your novel that the novels that you're working on, anything like the pandemic and how did, how did they deal with those kinds of things in the. So in Fatal Intent was written and completed long before COVID. In fact, it was bought before COVID. So I am, um, that doesn't have anything in it other than wearing masks in the operating room. Like we always right. did. Right. Um, I wrote another book well before COVID that deals with um, a virus causing worldwide infertility. It was a biological weapon. And so I'm having trouble selling that book because nobody wants to buy a book about a virus and complications from a virus. But in that book, I don't talk at all about wearing masks and that sort of stuff. It's all about finding the cure to infertility. It's not about, Oh, right. You know what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the prequel to that is the development of the, of the weapon. And, and that also doesn't really talk about pandemics. Right. Um, my, the book I'm working on now, I, you know, really don't address it. And, yeah. and there's a book I've started reading recently that was again, written before the pandemic, but it's very much dealing with the pandemic and everybody mm-hmm. wearing masks. And I stopped reading it. I was just, it was just not something I felt like reading right now. Yes. I'm gonna keep it. I'll read it eventually. Yeah, I was because I listened to what should I read? I always talk about what should I read next on almost every episode uh, with Ann Bogle. And it's she has so many guests that some of them just want to read that kind of thing. It's a comfort for some reason. And then yeah. other people are like, no, 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 I can't. I can't read that. And I'm one yeah. of those. I don't want to read that. Thing. And she was talking about a book or someone that I was talking to was talking about a book that was written about, it's a novel about a pandemic, but it was written like five years ago or something. Mm-hmm. And, and it, so, and it, it's kind of do, 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 cause it, <laughs> cause it sort of is like what's going on right now. It's like, how did that person know what was, what was going to happen? You know? Right. But yeah, yeah I, I'm with you. I, I just, I'm into fantasy right now and, um, historical novels and, you know, things that are, that, uh, take me away that are fun. Right. Escapist. Yes. 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 Although I am reading Brene Brown's, um, Atlas of the heart. That's a really interesting book. She's amazing. She is amazing. Yes. Yeah. So I have read a lot of her books, not all of them, but a lot of them. So I just really love her. So that's a fun, it's an interesting book because it's defining emotions and helping us with our vocabulary. Cause a lot of the emotions, sometimes we feel things and we don't know how to put words to it. And it helps Mm -hmm. us if we can put words to it. That's the, yeah, that's a good point purpose of the book. Yeah. But I, I haven't read nonfiction a whole lot except for the, I've read a couple. Well, I'm working on Brene Brown's, but I read another nonfiction book this year, but last year, I don't think I read any nonfiction books. So I was just reading books to make myself feel better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get that. Yeah. What is your favorite genre of book? Do you have a favorite genre that you like to read? I'm well, lately I have read pretty much only thrillers in mm-hmm. part because I'm trying to learn better how to write thrillers. Oh, so I'm trying yes. to pay attention to how they write them. Mm-hmm. Um, mysteries I enjoy. Um, mm-hmm. L- Louise Penny is my favorite oh. um, author. I love mm-hmm. her um, police procedural sort of stuff set in Quebec. And mm-hmm. then Harlan Coben. I just I absolutely love what he writes. Oh, 
Lee Child, I read all the Reacher stuff, and uh, Michael Connolly, I read all of his stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, working through the Bones series, Kathy Reich mm. series, and I've read a lot of Tess Gerritsen's stuff. She also blurbed my book. Yeah, I, I mostly read thrillers. I just finished a Lisa Unger book today. I've read a couple romances just to cleanse my palate sort of thing. And also they're really good for paying attention to how they um, do facial expressions because I find that very challenging in Mm -hmm. in my writing. Um, But for the most part, I try to have a thriller that I'm reading and then also a a nonfiction book. So Mm -hmm. something that I learned something from. Yes. Yeah. Well, I learned something from uh, the books that I read too, but yes, it's a different kind of learning. Yeah. Different kind. That's right. So um, I like mysteries a lot, but I don't think I've read a whole lot. I've read some Lee Child and one Louise Penny. Penny. And what's the difference between, this is just me being weird or academic or something. What's the difference between a thriller and a mystery? The main difference from what I hear is in a mystery, you're usually the the thing that happened, happened off screen, often <gasps> the dead body or the thing getting stolen or whatever. Why? And then you, and you have no knowledge of it, you know, no knowledge beyond what the uh, protagonist has. So you're walk, working with the investigator or the amateur sleuth or whoever it is you're uh-huh. you're sort of seeing it through their eyes and trying to solve the mystery along with them mm. whereas in a thriller you often know more than the protagonist you know that the bomb is about to explode and that they need to get out of there kind of stuff uh, yeah. um, and usually in a thriller there is some danger to the protagonist whereas in a mystery it might just be the policeman you know right. solving the mystery um, right. without being targeted Right. That's a very non-accurate description, but, but it works for me. No, it helps. That helps a lot because yeah, I, I've read, I read the CAD file series, which is a monk in the 1100s, um, helping the sheriff of the Shire solve mysteries. (laughs) You know, I've read those kind of things that Grandchester, which is a minister who helps solve mysteries. You know, those kinds of things. But I, I haven't read a whole lot of thrillers, so I may have to try that genre. I may have to try that. I have a Kathy Reich sitting on my shelf down there. Maybe I'll go read one of her books. Yeah, hers are, um, a lot of hers are mystery. You know, how did the body mm. get killed? Because she was a forensic pathologist, so that's, and, and well, a professor. Yes. Well, and Bones it was one of my favorite television series. It's a great I, series, isn't I, it? Oh, it is. I we watched every single episode and I love it. I loved it. Yeah. So, okay. So a thriller. I'll have to I'll have to try a thriller. You're you're enticing me. Oh, maybe I'll go get your book. It's a thriller. There yeah. you go. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's kind of fun. Yeah. Well, you know, if you have fun writing it, I think that that makes a difference, you know. It's obvious to me, the people, well, I'm, I'm going to liken this to theater or movies or something. It's obvious the ones who are having fun on the stage or who are having fun on the screen. Um, And then sometimes it's obvious the ones that aren't having so much fun, but yes. So maybe it's that way with books too. The ones that grab me are the ones where the author is really having fun writing the book. They had fun writing the book. Yeah. Yeah, I love Louise Penny. Just the the world she creates in Three Pines. The characters are so quirky, but every single one of them is so three dimensional. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, she breaks a lot of rules with her head hopping and stuff. But somehow, when she does it, it doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, and uh, and uh, they're just I just love each one of them, and uh, and where she takes them in in each story. Yeah. I said, you want to just go sit in the bistro that she created and chat with all these great characters. I know, really. Yes. I only read the first one because I was gifted it for Christmas. And and I I want to find out what happens with that. I've forgotten the main character, Gamash. Armand Gamash. He's yes. The... Yeah, There's because... like 14 of them now. Yeah. Yes, I know. So 
I'll have to read a couple more of those and see. The, um, I don't know if you do audiobooks, but the narrator for those is phenomenal. Oh. He is so good. Um, he unfortunately passed away. Oh. And the last two books are two or three are read by someone else, but he also does a great job. But that makes such a difference when the when the narrator is amazing. Yes. Yes, it does. I don't do audiobooks much because I'm on the computer so much. And uh, if I'm podcasting, if I'm editing, if I'm writing show notes, I can't have that other uh, distraction in my head. I have to. Oh, yeah. No, I listen to them like when I'm walking the dogs or right going for a run or folding laundry or yes. driving in a commute. That's or when cooking. I listen to yeah, yes. sometimes I'll listen to a podcast when I'm cooking. We don't do audiobooks very often, but I'm thinking of subscribing to a service in what's it called? Scribd, I think is what it's called. And you can get audiobooks, ebooks, and um yep. and, and then uh, I do it almost exclusively through our library. If you have a library card, mm -hmm. my library subscribes to um, Libby and uh, you can download books for 21 days. So I listen to a lot of my audio oh, books that way. Oh, that's great. Yes. I have to go. They're good for books. when you're in a car too. If you guys are going on these super long car trips, uh -huh. if you pick the right book that both of you enjoy. Yes. Well, we decided one of them is going to be around the world in 80 days because we've been watching the masterpiece around the world in 80 days. And okay. we wanted to compare versions because we've seen two or three versions now of that story. And so, well, let's go find out what the original book was like. That's kind well, of that's a good idea. idea. Yeah. I, I read that in high school. I remember very little except his name. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, I don't. I didn't read it in high school. We read Dickens and some other things, but yeah. So that's one of them that we're going to listen to. You. Yes. But we're big podcasters too. So we listen to podcasts. Um, What's your favorite? My favorite is what should I read next? But my husband's a techie. So he listens to all kinds of tech ones. The one that is kind of in the middle between us is called, uh, the incomparable and there are they have several different kinds the incomparable has several different ones some of them are unusual kinds of things like one I remember we listened to was all about how curb cuts changed the world <laughs> seemed interesting. really interesting yeah seemed interesting uh well and it was like it's it was originally devised, curb cuts were originally devised for people who had disabilities, but mothers with their, you know, strollers with their children or people who had, you know, other, like they were rolling their um, groceries home or, you know, I mean, it, was yeah. like, it turned out to be a lot of different people it just turned out to be a great thing for society to have these curb cuts. I mean, and then there was another one about flags and good flag design, <laughs> but the one, random stuff. So yeah, fascinating. Yeah. And the one that we listen to is a lot of times it's about movies. So, cause uh -huh. we're both big movie busts. And so they'll talk about different movies or different actors or their, the actor's, like filmography or something like that. So those are the kinds that we listen to that are, that we both like, that my husband and I both like. Yeah. The um, Roman Mars has created several different podcasts that are very interesting. So yeah, we listen to those and, and I listen to my own podcast after it's aired, just to make sure. It's oh, do you? Yeah. I make sure it sounds okay. Because I'm That's the good. engineer and I don't know what I'm doing. And <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully one day somebody else will take over that part and it'll sound a lot better. <laughs> um, but my husband helped me pick to pick out music for it after the first year. And yeah, That's so cool. yeah, I've learned how to use garage garage band enough so that I can edit it and put the music with the the, the audio and stuff but it's not perfect and that's okay yeah you're passing on information that's right i'm doing and entertaining it. that's right and uh it, eventually it will sound a lot better but i'll still have fun interviewing people and talking to them about their 
fun, creative endeavors. Do you have any other hobbies that you do besides writing? Um, we play tennis and golf and uh, we follow gator football. Mm. Um, we have a couple that we do a lot with playing. A, we play a lot of cards. When I get to see the kids, we play games and hiking is my probably my favorite thing um, oh. in the mountains. So every summer we try to go somewhere and go hiking. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, I read a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to build puzzles and I used to like sewing and doing some crafting stuff. I haven't really taken the time for that anymore. Yeah, I uh, now that I'm so much older, it's kind of hard with bifocals <laughs> to oh, do yeah. the yeah to do the the uh, I used to do counted cross stitch, and now I probably will not ever finish the one that I have. <laughs> <laughs> I did that when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a huge project, and uh, I'm only about halfway finished, but we'll see. I don't know. But um, speaking of puzzles, we started a puzzle about a year ago and we just finished it. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, well, it, was it must have been of, a tough one. It was a little difficult, especially since I put the border together because it had this distinctive border. And then one day my husband's trying to do the puzzle and he goes, I think this is upside down. And so, <laughs> <laughs> once we turned it around, it was so much easier to do. <laughs> yes we like to have a puzzle on the table all the time yeah we do out here at the lake Mm -hmm. that's cool yeah Yeah. that's another time I listen to audiobooks is when I'm building a puzzle oh yeah my husband's not doing it with me yeah Right. I have to always look at my husband to see if he's got his AirPods in his ear. So before I start talking to him, right? Yes. <laughs> or I have to go, I want to say something to you. <laughs> my Tap husband him on the shoulder. complains that he has to do that with me as well. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. I, that's why I try to, I try to um, make sure that I'm listening while he's at work or something. Right. So that we can actually have conversations. <laughs> it's kind of important. Yes. When you when you've been married a long time, even it's important to have conversations. So oh man, this has been so much fun. Do you have anything else you want to say before we go? I don't think so. I hope that some of your listeners will choose to listen to or Fatal Intent is available as a book, ebook. And by the time this comes out, the paper book will be out and oh. uh audiobook. Oh. Um, every few months, Amazon puts it on sale. So mm-hmm. you might bet, but, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. but yeah, it, I enjoyed it. And I hope, uh, I hope maybe people will go on my site and read about living wills and have that discussion with their families. Yes. That's all. Oh, that's important. Yes. I was talking with the healthcare professional about that, that I probably Good. should do something like that. And I said, yes. Yeah. It's so important. Yes. I should have a will, but I don't have a living will thing, you know, end of life thing. And when does your second book come out and what's the title of it? Uh, the second book is called Misfire and it comes out January 2nd of 23. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. It takes a long time to produce a book. It, it really does. Yes. Mm, and goodness. I guess there's paper shortages and all sorts of crazy stuff. So that's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so you so you'll have that one eventually in an audiobook too, right? It'll yeah, be- the audiobook for Fatal Intent came out like a month after the uh-huh. hardcover. So I'm uh-huh. assuming it'll be about the same uh-huh. time. So audio it'll be a physical book, an ebook, and an audiobook. All yeah, of the, them. the hardcover comes out at the same time as the ebook. Ah. And then about a month or so later, the audiobook comes out. And then a year later, the paperback comes out. Oh, that's just how Ocean View does it. I think that's I mean, how a lot of publishers do. Yeah, they don't put the paperback out. Yeah, until it's been out for a while. So I right. hope it's selling. Is it still selling okay, your book? So when you traditionally publish, you don't actually know. There's all you can look at is your Amazon sales rank. Um, oh. But um, I get a royalty statement twice a year. So the only thing I've heard was in October, I heard how the first couple months went. So I won't really know numbers, but um, Mm -hmm. it's, you know, in the thousands. So that's good. Yeah, Um, that is good. It's not New York Times good, but it's 
<laughs> it's good for a small publisher. Yes. Well, you know, I'm kind of of the opinion. I don't want to be a big celebrity writer or podcaster. Or so, uh, yeah, if I'm in the middle, uh, that's good for me. <laughs> yeah. I would like to reach a lot of people. It's not about money for me, just because I'm fortunate that it doesn't need to be, but I, yeah. I'd like I'd like to have an impact. So yes, that's that's my goal. And if anybody wants to do a book club with it, just go on my website and um, there's questions, but also they can drop me a line and I'd be happy to zoom in and chat with the readers if they would like me to. Yeah. Do you have questions at the end of the book for? Yeah. Book clubs? Oh yeah. The, for Fatal Intent, the questions are on my website, but for Misfire, they're going to be at the end of the book. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's important. I didn't do that, but yeah, I have maps. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I have maps, but I don't have, uh, I don't have questions for book club people. Yeah. I just added it and then put it on my website. Cause I'm in a book club and, and it's yeah. always when it's my turn trying to figure out the questions is a challenge. So it's nice it if, is. if they're provided by somebody. Yes. If, it, if the author has some for you, that's always good. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. I spent a fair amount of time on the ones for this next one. So hopefully yeah. people will find them useful. Oh, good. Well, it just sounds like you're having so much fun, Demi. That's I great. Am. Yes. Thank you very much for inviting me. You're welcome. Thank you for being my guest. I just, I can't wait to go read your book now. (laughs) Awesome. Thanks. Let me know what you think. I will. I will. Before I go, I'd like to give a big shout out to Podmatch, which I call a dating service for podcasters. Since I joined their platform, I have met so many wonderful people from all over the world And they make the matches so easy that if you are a podcaster or you have a message that you want to share, you might want to consider checking them out. The affiliate link is at the bottom of my show notes on my website at sagewomanchronicles at sagewoman.life. Part of what I love about them is that they promote civil conversations and can't reuse that right now. So if you check them out, tell them Lucinda sent you. I'd also like to invite you to my Patreon community, where we will have chats with authors or creators. We'll have member chats about the stories that they love, and occasionally we'll have extra episodes or uncut episodes of Story Power. So please go check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash storypower without the hyphen, all one word. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and give us a review on your favorite podcast app. It will help people find us. You can leave a comment there. And remember, as Philip Pullman said... After nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Until next time, this is Lucinda Sage Midgordon. Thanks for listening.